Okay, so we've got a nice problem where we need to evaluate the sum of floor functions of fractions where m and n are both integers greater than or equal to 1. And to get started on this problem, instead of having this expressed using the floor function, we'll introduce some more notation. So you can think of the floor function as being the integer part of a number, but we're going to be interested in also expressing the decimal part or the fractional part of a number. So we've just defined this as the number minus its integer part. So just to illustrate this with an example, let's say we're interested in the decimal part of 4.6, and this is 4.6 minus the floor function of 4.6, or 4.6 minus 4, just 0.6. So it's just as simple as getting rid of the integer part and the other bit that's left. So what we can do now is we can express this sum as the sum from k equals 1 up to m minus 1. Instead of writing this using the floor function, we'll write it as kn over m minus the decimal part of kn over m, the fractional part. And this is nice because now we can work with this kn over m term. So here we're summing over k, so we can take out this factor of n over m, and then we're left with a nice sum which is going to be easy to evaluate. Sum from k equals 1 to m minus 1 of just k. Then we're also left with this term, the sum from k equals 1 to m minus 1 of our decimal part of kn over m. We'll deal with this term later. But here, the sum of the integers from 1 up to m minus 1, there's a nice formula we can apply here. So we just get n over m times a half times m minus 1 times m. And you'll see here your m's cancel. Then we keep this sum as it is. And finally, we can just tidy this up a little bit. We have n into m minus 1 over 2. So we've already evaluated part of this. And now the main challenge is going to be evaluating this second sum here, so the sum from k equals 1 to m minus 1 of the fractional part of kn over m. And to understand what's going on for this second sum, it can be helpful just to have a look at some examples of the fractional part of certain fractions. So if you've got a fraction which is less than or equal to 1, then it's straightforward enough, it just stays the same. But if you've got a top-heavy fraction, let's say the fractional part of 9 over 4, this turns into 1 quarter, because you're essentially writing this as 2 and a quarter and getting rid of the 2. So on the top you put the remainder when you divide 9 by 4. And similarly, if you had something like 38 over 7, you divide 38 by 7, you get 5 remainder 3, and our fractional part of this becomes 3 over 7. So this is just 5 and 3 sevenths. So the pattern we're starting to see here that we could maybe make use of is, let's say we've got the fractional part of A over B. Perhaps we can write this then as the remainder when you divide a by b, which more rigorously you can write as a mod b, all divided by b. And here we're not thinking of this as an equivalence class, this is just what number would you write if you're going to write a mod b. And we can understand this a bit more rigorously because the fractional part of a divided by b, let's write a, imagine we're dividing a by b, then you'll have some sort of quotient multiplied by b plus your remainder part, which is just a mod b, all of this divided by b. And we're looking for the fractional part of all of this. So q times b divided by b gives us an integer. Then a mod b divided by b, this is going to give us a fraction which is less than 1, because a mod b is always going to be less than b. So this tells us why we can now write this as a mod b, all divided by b. And the upshot of this for our formula now is we can write the fractional part of kn over m as kn mod m all divided by m. So what we can do now is replace this in our formula, but then there is still some more work to do to actually evaluate the sum. So the first thing we can do here is take out this factor of 1 over m, which doesn't depend on k. So now we can write our sum as 1 over m times the sum from k equals 1 up to m minus 1 of just kn modulo m. And something else we'll do, which will make sense in a sec when we start to look at the patterns involved here, is instead of summing from 1 up to m minus 1, let's imagine we add in the k equals m term as well. So you would have m times n modulo m, which would just be 0. So this doesn't actually affect the value of our sum, so we'll add in this extra term just so that our patterns are a bit nicer when we look at some examples. So we start off, we'll just look at an example, let's say n equals 2, and m equals 5. Just try and understand what's going on with this sum here. So the sum from k equals 1 to m of kn modulo m, we're now looking at the sum of basically our 2 times table modulo 5. 
So you start off with two mod 5 is 2, 4 mod 5 is 4, 6 mod 5 is 1, 8 mod 5 is 3, and finally 10 mod 5, our zero term that we added in, is just going to give us zero. So let's have a look at another example. So we get some really nice behaviour when m and n don't have any common factors when they're co-primes. Let's say n is 7, m is 4. So here we're going up in our 7 times tables modulo 4 essentially. So 7 mod 4 gives us 3, 14 mod 4 gives us 2, 21 mod 4 gives us 1, and finally 28 mod 4 gives us 0. So we seem to get some nice behaviour here. We're just cycling through all of the numbers from 0 up to 4 here, or going from 0 up to 3 here. We get slightly different behaviour if m and n have common factors. So let's say we've got n is 4 and m is 10 now. So we're going up in our 4 times tables modulo 10. So we have 4 plus 8 plus 12 mod 10 is 2, 16 mod 10 is 6, and 20 mod 10 gives us 0. Then 24 mod 10 takes us back to 4, 28 mod 10 is 8, 32 gives us 2, 36 gives us 6, and finally 40 gives us a 0. So there's some cycling through here, not of our just going up from 0 in 1s, but we're going up in 2s here. We'll have a look at one more example before we start to generalise this pattern. So when n is 3 and m is 9, we're going up in the 3 times tables modulo 9, so we have 3 mod 9 is 3, 6 mod 9 is 6, 9 mod 9 is 0, 12 mod 9 is 3, 15 mod 9 gives us 6, 18 mod 9 gives us 0, then we're up to 21 mod 9 takes us back to 3, 24 mod 9 gives us 6, and 27 mod 9 gives us another 0. So there seems to be some really interesting structure here that we're repeating. We seem to be going up in actually steps of the highest common factor, the greatest common divisor of m and n. So I'll just introduce a little bit more notation. We'll define d to be the greatest common divisor, the highest common factor of m and n, so just the biggest number which goes into both m and n. Then what we're saying then is that this sum, going from k equals 1 up to m, of kn modulo m, this seems to give us, we're actually getting d copies of a sum which starts at 0, then we're going up in d, so d plus 2d, and so on. So how many of these do we get? In the end, we're going all the way up to m over d, but because we've included 0, we take away 1, so we actually have m over d minus 1 times d as our final term there. So this is an arithmetic progression, so we'll be able to sum this nice and easily. So what we've done here is we've written the sum as equal to d copies of a nice arithmetic progression. Now we haven't proved this particularly rigorously, and I won't go into any more details on this, but if you're interested, you could think of perhaps these numbers here, all of our numbers modulo m as a group, and then you could see here we're summing over a subgroup here, so the subgroup generated by actually by d here, so generated by 2 or generated by 3 here. So if you want to try and turn this into a more rigorous proof, if you're interested, you could have a go using Lagrange's theorem, for example, to show that we do indeed get d copies of a sum which starts at 0 and goes almost all the way up to m. But we won't go into this in any more detail now. Now we're ready to tidy up all of this and actually evaluate the sum. So we've got n into m minus 1 over 2 from earlier, then we're taking away 1 over m multiplied by d, then we've got this arithmetic progression here going up to m over d minus 1 times d. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take out a factor of d here, which gives us n, n minus 1 over 2, then minus d squared over m, then all we're summing here is just 1 plus 2 plus 3 and so on, up to m over d minus 1. So we can evaluate this really easily, just like before. So we get n, m minus 1 over 2, then using our sum of integers up to m over d minus 1, we get a half times m over d minus 1 times m over d. You can see here we're going to get quite a bit of cancellation. This m cancels with this m, our d cancels with one of the d's here. Then we can tidy this up a little bit further we should get a nice expression in the end. So n into m minus 1 over 2, then it's minus d over 2, and if we write m over d minus 1 as m minus d over d, you can see these two d's cancel as well, giving us a nice expression where everything can be put over the same denominator of 2 now. So we get n into m minus 1 minus m 
plus d all of this over 2. So we get a really nice tidy expression for our sum in the end. What we can do is tidy this up a little bit further as well. We'll expand the brackets. We get nm minus n minus m plus, we write d as the greatest common divisor of m and n. All of this divided by 2 gives us our final answer there. And we get a really interesting corollary for free as well here. So if you look at this final expression, this is actually symmetrical in n and m. So if you were to swap the role of n and m, so swap your n and m here in this sum, you should get the same outcome. So if we look now at the sum from k equals 1, instead of up to m minus 1, up to n minus 1, of the floor function of km over n, perhaps quite surprisingly, this is actually equal to the same sum where we swap the roles of m and n.